Hi guys, this is Arvind here from Mind Magics, and today I welcome you all to this amazing session on Rulesoft interview questions. Okay, so like our previous video series, we are continuing with the interview questions. Okay, and this time the topic is Mulesoft. So we'll be discussing a few Mulesoft interview questions, which are asked very frequently in the interviews. So if you want to crack the interview in the first attempt itself, so I think you should be going through these questions, and they will help you a lot in the actual interview. So before moving ahead. Please subscribe to Mind Magic's YouTube channel and also hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update from us. Okay, so without wasting any further time, let's get started. So before discussing the first question, so I'll, I'm going to share you one interesting trick to get the most out of these videos. Okay, so what you do is when you read the first question on your screen, what is Mulesoft? So what you can do is you can pause the video and you can recollect the answer to this question. Okay, and once you recollect the answer in your own mind. Okay, so then you can play the video and you can listen to whatever the answer that I have explained related to this question. Okay, so the benefit of this trick is that you can match the answer which is mentioned on your screen and the answer that you have collected in your own mind. Okay, so you can compare that and you can see where you are missing or whether you are on the correct track or not. Okay, so this is a very important trick to get most out of such videos. Okay, so any interview questions related video. Okay. So let's get started with our first question. The first question is obviously very simple and an obvious one. What is MuleSoft? Okay, so MuleSoft is a solution that is based on cluster and this integrates data application and APIs based on premises and over the cloud platform as well. Okay, so MuleSoft works on the any point connectivity model and this model helps in connecting any existing software as a service based applications or it can also connect to a set of APIs through one single API interface. Okay, so this was a quick definition and a very simple definition of MuleSoft. Okay, so let's move ahead to the next question. So what is Mule ESB? Okay, so ESB stands for Enterprise Service Bus. Okay, so Mule is a runtime engine of the Java based ESB integration platform. So what is the use of Mule ESB? So it allows the development teams to connect and access flexibly and easily exchange the data. Okay, so this is one critical point of Mule ESB. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, so initially what happens in interview is that you will get a simple questions in the beginning. And as you keep on answering those questions, so the level of the questions will increase. Okay, I'm talking about the difficulty level. Okay, so we are going to do the same thing over here as well. Okay, initially we'll have simple questions and gradually we will increase the difficulty level of the questions. Okay, so the next question is why Mule ESB is so popular? Okay, so here in this question, you have to highlight the features of Mule ESB. Okay, so MuleSoft is a lightweight technology that supports high level of scalability. Okay, so what is the meaning of scalability? It means that it allows you to start small and scale as per your requirements. Okay, so you can connect to multiple number of applications within a single environment and it has zero or nil restrictions for apps communication as well. Okay, so MuleSoft manages n number of application interactions with each other without restricting that application into the same VM interaction or other VM interactions. Okay, so it means even though the application is running into different VMs or virtual machines, they can interact with each other. Okay, so it's flexibility with transportation protocol enables the interaction with ease. Okay, so though there are many ESPs available in the market, MuleSoft gives you the most flexible and reliable services. Okay, so these were some of the reasons for the high popularity of Mule ESB. Okay, or the MuleSoft. Let's move on to the next question, which is what are the features of Mule ESB? Okay, so ESB is used for integration using a service oriented approach as we discussed earlier. So if you talk about the features, then you can highlight some of the features as you can see on the screen such as set of service containers, message transformation service. The third is the message routing service. And the fourth feature is the web service security. Okay, so here if the interviewer asks you to highlight these points or elaborate these points, you can do it. Okay, so mostly if the interviewer asks you to elaborate these points, so that is mostly done for the experienced candidates. So if you're a fresher candidate, you can just mention the features. Okay, so like we have mentioned here. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. So what are the different types of primitives used in mediation? Okay, so as you can see on the screen, these are the various types of primitives which are used in mediations, such as message filter, 
type filter, endpoint lookup, service invoke, fan in, fan out, XSLT, bio map, message element setter. Okay. And you can also mention data handler, custom mediation, header setters, message logger, even emitter, stop, fail, subflow, and so on. Okay. So these are the various types of primitives that are used in mediation. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. So what are the different types of exception handlings? Okay. So first you must mention what exception handling is. Okay. So as you can see on the screen, these are the various types of exception handlings, such as choice exception handling, cats exception, rollback exception, global exception, and default exception. Okay. So this was another very simple question. The next question here is what is shared resource in Mule and how they have been used? Okay. Or how you can use them. Okay. So the answer to this question is we can make connectors a reusable component by defining them as common resources and expose them to all the applications that are deployed under the same domain. Okay. And these resources are known as shared resources. So how do you use the shared resources? So the shared resources needs to be defined inside the new domain project and then refer to each of the projects that are meant to use the elements which are present inside it. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. So the next question is what are the different types of ESBs that are present in the market as of now? Okay. So the answer to this question is very simple. So you can mention talent, mule ESB, JBoss, fuse ESB, and so on. Okay. The next question is what are the various types of variables that are used in mule ESB? Okay. So the answer to this question is also very simple. So as you can see on the screen, these are the three types of variables that are present in mule, such as record variable, flow variable, and session variable. Okay. So if you want, like if you want to create a good impression on the interviewer, so you can give one example as well. Okay. Of these variables. Okay. So I'll leave that to you like to figure out the example. Okay. So you'll have to figure out what are the examples that you can mention for these types of variables. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. So what is the definition of web services or what do you mean by web services? Okay. So web service is a function or a program that can be written in any language and that can be accessed over HTTP. So the message format for web services can be either XML or JSON or any other program as long as other programs are able to understand and communicate. Okay, so any web service has a client service relationship. So web services can be synchronous or asynchronous. Also, you must mention that web services can have multiple clients as well. Okay, so this was the quick definition of web services. Okay, so the next question here is how to find when the project needs ESB. ESB implementation is not suitable for all types of projects. Okay, so it doesn't come with like one size fits all requirement. Okay, so proper analysis needs to be done to figure out whether we can use ESB for the project or not. So there are some points that you must consider while analyzing the need of ESB, such that you can consider that if the project requires integrating three or multiple applications or services, Okay, if the need is to communicate between two applications using point to point integration. Okay, so using ESB can suffice this need. So the next point here is you must figure out whether the project needs to be scaled in future and whether you will need interaction with more services in the future. Okay, so not all projects need this feature as they may perform relatively smaller tasks. Okay, so next point here is you can figure out whether your project needs message routing capabilities such as forking and aggregating message flows. Okay, so such features are not required by all the projects. Okay, so you must also figure out whether the architecture of your project is based on which features. Okay, so it's much better to do simple POCs by integrating small parts and you can evaluate the benefits of such integrations. Okay, so, so the last point you must consider here that ESB is a costly affair. Okay. So you must also take into consideration the budget requirement of your project. Okay. So if integrating mule ESB fits in the budget of your project, you must go ahead with it. Okay. Given the fact that there is also a requirement of ESB. Okay. So these are the, some of the points that you must consider before selecting ESB. Let's move on to the next question. What are the different types of flow processing strategies? Okay. So as you can see on the screen, these are the various types of flow processing strategies, such as asynchronous flow processing strategy custom thread per processing strategy, queued asynchronous flow processing strategy, synchronous flow processing, non-blocking flow processing, and so on. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. The next question is how to create and consume 
soap service in MuleSoft. So creating the soap service. So how do you create a soap service? So we can create this the same way as we create the Mule project with RAML. The only change that needs to be done here is that instead of RAML, we need to import concert WSTL. Okay. And this was all about the creating SOAP service. And how do you consume the SOAP service? So for that purpose, you can use web service consumer or CXF component in our Mule workflow to access or consume the SOAP service. Okay. So this was another very important question that you must give attention to. Okay. The next question here is, explain the ESB integration core principles. So as you can see on the screen, these are the core integration principles, transformation, mediation, and non-functional consistency. Okay. So what do you mean by transformation? So data transformation between canonical data formats and specific data formats required by ESB connector. Okay. So transport protocol negotiation between multiple formats such as HTTP, JMS, JDBC, and so on. Okay. So this was all about the transformation. The next point here is the mediation. So what is the purpose of mediation? So providing multiple interfaces for the purpose of supporting multiple versions of a service for backward compatibility or alternatively allowing for multiple channels to the same underlying component implementation. So the second requirement may involve providing multiple interfaces to the same component, which is nothing but one legacy interface and one standards compliant interface, which can be either SOAP or XML. Okay. And the third point here is that non-functional consistency. Okay. For a typical ESB initiative, this can include consistency around the way security and monitoring policies are applied and implemented. Okay. So these were some of the core integration principles of Mule ESB. So the next question is how to select an ESB. So as you can see on the screen, these are the points that you must consider before selecting an ESB. Okay. The first point here is usability. Okay, so you must figure out how complicated the installation process is. Okay, the learning curve of the ESB should not be too difficult. Okay, the next point here is maintainability. You must figure out how do you monitor the product. Okay, so if any GUI terminal is available for monitoring the services or not. So the next point here is that of community. So you must figure out is there an active community for the given ESB? Okay, so you can have a look at the various discussion forums, tutorials, and so on. And now the next point is the enterprise support. Okay, so is the support which is available for this product, whether is it reliable or not? Okay, and if it is reliable, what are the types of services that are available? The next point here is that of flexibility. So can the ESB be configured to meet the business requirements of the projects? The next point here is reliability. The reliability of the ESB depends on the current users and the various case studies that are available for the ESB. And the last point here is that of cost. So the cost is a very important highlight of ESB. If the cost of the ESB fits the requirement of your project and it is within your budget as well. So that is very important point that you must consider. The next question here is, what do you mean by the statement any point platform as per the context of MuleSoft? So MuleSoft is a secure, robust and highly scalable communication network that allows the application to do the self-services. It helps the organization to integrate applications, data and multiple devices in a flexible environment. Okay. So it is a hybrid application integration platform that includes ESB, unified solutions for APIs management and application design and publishing. So with MuleSoft, you can use multiple number of software and tools such as API designer, AnyPoint Studio, API manager, API analytics, API portal, and so on. Okay, let's move on to the next question and which is what are the advantages of using an ESB? So the first point here is high level of operational control from the central web-based portal. With ESB, you get a wide range of connectivity through more than 120 leading software as a service based applications. And that too, this is provided using on-premises. Okay. With ESB, you can ensure zero message loss, which means that it is reliable as well. And it gives you high availability all the time. Okay. The next point here is that custom code out of data mapping with graphical integration and transformation. Apart from this, you can also consider the benefits such as analytics and API management. Okay, so ESB is equipped with thousands of automated tests and bug fixing techniques. ESB also provides you with batch integration with real-time integration techniques. So these are the advantages of using an ESB. Okay, so the next question here is, what is transient context? So transient context is used to pass the required values within the existing flow, either the requesting flow or the responding flow. Okay, 
So the transient flow could not make it link with the requests or the response together. So it is not used across. Okay. So what does this mean? So it cannot be used if you want to save an input message before service gets invoked into the request or response flow. Okay. So transient is made to act as temporary storage of messages in general after the service invokes a call. The next primitive creates another message by combining the two. First, the invoked response and the second, the original message that is stored in the transient context. Let's move on to the next question. So the next question is, what are the different types of messages in Mutesoft? The first type is echo and log message. So log messages and move them from inbound to outbound routers. Okay. The second type is bridge message. So basically, a passed message from inbound to outbound routers is an example of bridge message. The third type of message is built message. So these are nothing but messages that are created from fixed or any dynamic values. So the next question is, what do you mean by an API and define the most prominent features of API? Okay, so API stands for application programming interface. So it is nothing but a software interface that allows two different applications to interact in one platform. Okay, and if you talk about the features, so API has multiple benefits in terms of user usability. Okay, so APIs have become modern and advanced within time and it adheres to many standards such as HTTP and REST. So APIs are developer friendly, easy to understand and broadly acceptable. APIs are mostly used as a product rather than set of codes. They are specifically designed for a particular group of audiences such as application developers and mobile app developers. Okay, so every API comes with a detailed documentation with version specific information and upgradation details. So if you talk about the security, APIs are highly secure application interfaces that allow you to operate within a robust environment. So these were some of the features of APIs. So the next question is, and a very important question, what do you mean by REST? So REST is nothing but representational state transfer or RESTful web service. So REST is nothing but a client server architecture, which means each unique URL is a representation of some object or a resource. So any REST API developer uses HTTP methods explicitly. And this in a way is consistent within the protocol definition. Okay, so this basic REST design principle establishes one-to-one -one mapping between create, read, update, and delete, which is nothing but crude operations and HTTP methods. So this was a quick definition of REST. So the next question here is, what is RAML and why do we use it? Okay, so RAML stands for RESTful API Modeling Language. Okay, so RAML is similar to WSDL. It contains endpoint URL, request or response schema, HTTP methods, and query and URL parameters. Okay, so RAML helps the client, which is a consumer of the service, what the service is and how or what all operations can be invoked. Okay, so RAML helps the developer in creating the initial structure of this API. RAML can also be used for documentation purposes. So let's move on to the next question. So the next question is, what are the message sources in Mule ESV? So message sources in Mule ESV are usually any point connectors, okay, elements that provide connectivity to a specific external source. And this can be done either using a standard protocol such as HTTP, FTP, or SMTP, or it can be done using a third-party API such as Salesforce, MongoDB, Twitter, and so on. The next question here is, what is the difference between ESB and JMS? So this is another very important question. So ESB provides the middleware and interfaces that allows businesses to connect with their applications without the need for writing any code. And if you talk about the JMS, so JMS provides the messaging capability and facilitates the communication between modules or the applications. The next question here is, why is MuleSoft preferred over other ESB implementations? So as we discussed earlier, the benefits of MuleSoft ESB. So MuleSoft is lightweight, but highly scalable. And this allows you to start small and connect to more applications over future. Okay, the ESB manages all the interaction between the applications and the components. And this is done in a transparent manner, regardless of whether they exist in the same VM or over the internet, and regardless of the underlying transport protocols used. Okay, so this is very important benefit of using MuleSoft. Okay, so several com commercial ESB implementation provides limited functionality or they are built on top of an existing application server or messaging server. And this locks you into that specific vendor. Okay, 
So MuleSoft is vendor neutral. So different vendor implementations can plug into it very easily. Okay, so you're, you are never locked into a specific vendor while you're using MuleSoft. The next question is define payload in MuleSoft. So the payload is a Mule runtime variable that stores arrays or objects. Okay, so this is wrapped under org.mule.api.mule message and it helps you get the different means of accessing the payload and that too under different formats. So Mule messages are similar to any other SOAP messages or JMS messages. And it also has container properties, headers, multiple names attached to it. The main content of the message is called payload. Let's move on to the next question, which is explain the concept of endpoint. So an endpoint is a destination shared by many other routers within the same group. Okay, so it also helps to create a global endpoint. Now, what is a global endpoint? A global endpoint is not similar to inbound and outbound routing service, but it makes it useful in many different places in the configuration file. Okay, the entire endpoint destination must be named to the specific service. Okay, so these names identify the global endpoint in the group of routers. The global endpoint also offers to clarify the usage of a specific destination. The next question here is explain mule transformer. Okay, so transformer prepares a message to be processed through a mule flow by enhancing or altering the message header or the message payload. For example, if the message source that triggers your flow receives data in XML format, but a downstream message processor requires JSON formatted data. So one or more transformation positioned between the message source and the message processor can achieve the necessary translation. So Mute Studio provides a set of standard transformers to handle the most common data transformation scenarios. Okay, so this was all about the Mule Transformer. So the next question is, what is the meaning of transport service descriptor in MuleSoft? So the transport service description is a technical configuration of the connector. Okay, so this is a hidden configuration that is used in each instance of the connector. So what is the benefit of using transport service descriptor? So it gives definition to the parameters, such as the use of particular parameters, what classes are required for that particular message receiver, dispatchers, and requesters. The definition is about default transformation to use inbound or outbound and utilizing the response of the router. So the next question here is, what is a router in MuleSoft? Okay, so the router is one of the most critical services in MuleSoft. The router finalizes and assigns the running territory for the messages to move from one to another services. Basically, routing is a process of controlling the transitory decided by the router for moving the message to transit from one source to another. It can be also called a gatekeeper of the endpoint services. So a router keeps track of the targeted successions to ensure that the messages get delivered to the right intended destination. Routers can also act as a bundle of classified tasks, such as it can split, sort, group, or regroup messages based on specified conditions or certain mappings. So let's move on to the next question, which is define the use of filter in view. Okay. So what, what are the uses of filter? So filters are the most powerful capability given to the routers to make smart decisions on the message delivery or request and response environment. Okay, so it also gives the site to the router to decide what to do with the messages in the transit stage. Some filters go through the intense analysis of the message to find out the actual value for the desired outputs. Okay, so this was the overall use of filter in MuleSoft. So the next question is very important as far as interview is concerned. So what do you mean by SDO and SME? Okay, so SDO stands for service data objects that are representation of variables and objects. And SMO is nothing but service model object and it is a pattern for use in SDO for messages. Okay, so this was the quick definition of SDO and SMO. So the next question is define the purpose of endpoint in mute. Okay, so earlier we had seen the definition of endpoint in MuleSoft. Okay, so now we have to figure out the purpose of endpoint. So endpoint defines the specific usage of the transport protocol. Okay, so either you are reading the message, writing it, listening or polling to a targeted destination, the endpoint directs the usability of the protocol. Okay, so endpoint controls the underlying entity which ensures the usability of the connectors. The targeted destination is defined as URI. It depends on the connectors that whether the destination will be treated as URI or URL or JMS or the destination itself. 
The next question is, what is the difference between service invoke and callout? So service invoke is an initial process of creating a service for either request or response flow. Okay, so the service can be request, response or both and one way implementation. So multiple instances of a service can be created and permitted into a flow that allows a series of services to operate within the flow. And if you talk about the callout, so the purpose of callout method is to receive the messages and requests, the required service and operation in a flow. There is a callout node always presented in the median flow for the connected target operation. If the call attempt is successful, the callout node in the responses flow median will start receiving the messages. If the callout attempt is unsuccessful, then the callout node will be set to retry the service in a flow depending on the type of fault that has been occurred. Let's move on to the next question, which is what is the mule context? In general, the message context defines the overall purpose of the message. But here the context defines the temporary area which is created along with the SMO in the median flow while the transition of the message. So SMO contains the shared context in the message flow. This shared context usually gets used at the time of aggregation, which means if you are aggregating, then there is the need to iterate the BO for the specified time. Aggregative context maintains the data between fan out and fan in primitives. Okay, so what do you mean by fan out and fan in? So we will discuss this point in the next part of this session. Okay, so the data present in the request flow cannot be persistent throughout the request and response flow because it only belongs to the request BO. Okay, so this was all about the mule context. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So how the messages in mule are composed? Okay, so if you talk about the composed message in mule, so there are four different parts to it. Okay, the first one is the payload. So which is nothing but main data context carried by a particular message. The next point is the properties. So it contains the beta information or header, which is similar to a SOAP message. Okay, and optionally, it contains name attachments. And this is to provide the support for multi-part messages or an exceptional payload for holding errors that occur during the event processing. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question is explain the configuration builder in MuleSoft. Okay, so what is configuration builder? So the configuration builder in Mule helps to transfer the human authorized configuration file into a complex graph of the object that substitutes a running node in the ESP. Okay, so the configuration builder can be of two types, which is first the string driven builder, which is working with the XML files. And the second is the script builder, which accepts scripting language files. The next question is explain the working functionality of the service layer. So Mule service is a set of all Mule entity, which requires to support the processing request in an arranged manner. So this service is defined by a particular configuration that defines the different elements from a different layer of these services. It mobilizes the request, which is open to receive a particular request. Okay, so it depends on the service layers input channels, whether a service can or cannot be accessible outside the public ESB. So the next question here is explain the transport layer functionality in MuleSoft. So the main operating task for the transport layer is to send and receive messages through the inbound and outbound communication networks. The transport layer gets configured with connectors, endpoints, and transformers. So transport is also responsible for message adapter where the responsibility of the adapter is to extract all the information from the particular request, such as data, meta information, or header information and attachments. It also stores the information that is available inside it. So let's move on to the next question. So the next question is explain the functionality of fan in and fan out. So guys, this is another very important question. Okay. So fan in and fan out is the method to implement a loop in the mediation. So if you talk about fan out, so you can use fan out primitive to trigger the output terminal initially with the input message or many times as per the need. Okay. So fan out can be used individually or as a combination of fan in and fan out. Okay, now if you talk about fan in, so fan in is a combination with fan out and this works as a decision point to identify when to continue the flow execution in the connector. Okay, so it accepts multiple number of messages until the decision point is made. The last message received in the flow is represented as an output terminal. So this was the functionality of fan in and fan out. Okay. 
the next question here is explain new data integrator so data integrator tool is launched by new that is a data visualization mapping tool having the support for flat files xml mapping and java objects so it was a tedious task for the developers to code complex mapping functionalities so the new data integrator tool provides drag and drop features to make the coding process easier okay the mapping process gets support from the eclipse where plugin has to be done before the process to run the data integrator which is a part of the top layer applications in the mules of architecture okay so guys these were all of the theory questions that are mostly asked in the mules of interviews okay so there are next seven to eight questions which we will be discussing and these questions are very important so as far as mule soft interview is concerned pay detailed attention to the next questions that we will be discussing okay so if you answer, successfully answer the coming questions that we will be discussing there are high chances that you will successfully clear the rules of interview so let's proceed with the next set of questions and the next question here is what are the guiding principles of mule esp okay so the guiding principles of mule esp are also known as core principles of mule in general okay so as you can see on the screen there are five guiding principles of mule esb and let's just discuss them one by one so the first principle is orchestration so this is a process of synchronizing two or more applications with each other to achieve a continuous flow of data and process okay the next principle is transformation so transformation is a process of transforming the data from the raw format to a specific application process data format okay the next principle here is transportation so transportation is a process similar to the transport layer which allows the transportation of messages using ftp http gms protocols for the network transmissions okay the next principle here is mediation so mediation provides multiple interfaces to support multiple application interactions with multiple version of services okay and the last principle here is non functional consistency so this guideline ensures mechanical support for handling transactions and security within the integrated environment okay so these are the guiding principles of mule esb okay let's move on to the next question so guys this question is very important from the interview perspective okay so what is the difference between point to point integration and esb integration okay so to answer this question you guys need to draw a diagram as you can see on the screen so this diagram is an example of point to point integration okay so for a middle or high level application the number of integration increases rapidly with the requirement to provide services web hosting messaging database manipulation storage and so many other related concerns with the p2p integration technique you can build the architecture to support the application but at the same time the architecture will become complex when the number of application increase okay also point to point has a lot of restrictions over platform compatibility and language support okay so let me give you an example to understand this the restrictions of a connectivity to a different platform and the complexity with the multiple application integration create the need for using mule esb okay so these were some of the problems with point to point integration and this led to the use of mule esb integration okay so once you draw this diagram and you highlight the drawbacks of this integration then what you can do is in the interview you can draw the next diagram which is an example of esb integration or mule esb integration okay so mule esb provides world class flexibility to integrate without having concerns about language support and compatibility issues with different application architectures it enhances the reusable capability of the application by encapsulating functionalities together in a single platform applications can be easily integrated in a synchronized manner as shown in the diagram okay so as you can see in this diagram various applications are integrated and that too in a very flexible manner okay so mule esb consists of two components for managing the integrations the first component is the service registry all the services exposed to the mule esb are stored registered and published from the service registry it is a repository that allows you to consume and access the services and application capabilities as per your own requirements and the next component here is the centralized administration so it is a transparent administration unit where all the access and capability of the application through services get controlled and monitored as a centralized unit of services okay so this was the major difference between point to point integration and esb integration 
let's move on to the next question okay so the next question is explain mules of architecture in detail okay so like the previous question guys you must also draw a diagram in this question the diagram as you can see on the screen it is very simple diagram okay so there are three layers and a few components for each particular layer okay so mules of follows three layer architecture for application integration and data processing so what are those three layers the, those three layers are application layer integration layer and transport layer okay so mule development can be configured and customized in three categories of tasks the first component is the service component development so this task involves encouraging the reusability of the pojos or the plain old java objects and spring bins developers who have the spring development knowledge can easily understand the pojo and the spring bins usabilities so pojo is a spring generated class which allows the use of getters and setters methods along with cloud connectors spring bins contains business logic for the application development and message enrichment okay so the next component here is service orchestration so it performs as a service mediation which allows integration of configuring the message processors adapters and the routers with transformers and filters the next component is the integration the integration of various applications is crucial for the large scale application development process it gives great flexibility to connect over many differently built applications regardless of the protocols that are used by them using the transport method simply allows messages to travel from one end to the another in the source and the destination channel it builds a high level of communication association between the applications to transmit the messages within the environment so you can easily get any available transport method or you can customize the transport method as per your own requirements okay if the interviewer asks you this question you must also draw the second diagram that you can see on the screen okay so in this diagram you must highlight the mule message components okay so what are those components the mule message is the data that passes through the mule flaws and is wrapped under the mule object so mule messages consist of the below components so the first component here is the header so like any normal header the mule header holds the metadata of the information it consists of two properties the first one is the inbound properties so inbound property is something that represents the directly sent messages by the source application the value and the structure of the message cannot be changed or modified as per the user's requirements and now if we talk about the outbound properties so these are the messages which contain the metadata similar to the inbound message but can be changed and mutable during the flow it can either be set by new or can be modified by the users of the application okay so the next component here is the payload so the payload is a message carrying an object which holds the actual message of the business and the third component here is the variables so variables are the user defined metadata about the messages variables are temporary representation of the information kept by the messages okay so guys as we have discussed earlier in the previous questions so there are three types of variables the first one is the flow the second one is session and the third one is the record okay so this was all about the mules of architecture in detail okay so let's move on to the next question so the next question here is what are the functionalities of esb okay so as you can see on the screen these are the various functionalities of esb so the first functionality is validate so schema validation is handled by validate esb uses a validation parser and updated schema to validate the schema outlines the next point here is enrich so the purpose of enriching is to add the additional data to a message it simply adds more meaning to the destination user the third point here is transform the process of converting the data into a sequential format that is easily accessible to the requesting application is called transformation the next point here is routing so you can call it as an endpoint or a gatekeeper of the service which provides a route to the services and commute between the source and the destination and the last point here is operate the word operates itself defines the functionality performed by the component it either invokes the required services or communicates with the targeted application for the service processing okay so this was all about the functionalities of esb so let's move on to the next question so the next question here is how to download mule soft and install it on your system okay so if if you are asked this question in the interview so the objective behind asking this question is whether the interview wants to know you have hands on experience with mule soft or not okay so this is also applicable to the experienced candidates okay so what are the steps to download mule soft and installing it on your system 
So as you can see on the screen, these are the various steps. Okay. So the first step here is downloading Bullsoft from the official website. So once you download the application from the official website, so that official website will contain a zip folder. Okay. So you'll be basically downloading a zip file. Okay. So once you download that zip file, so your next step is unzipping the zip file. So what you have to do is you have to unzip the downloaded file and run the mule4 binary exe file. So you have to set the environment variables as mule home and create a mule directory under the folder where you have extracted the downloaded file. Okay. So for example, once you create a directory on your system and you install the, or you can run the mule exe file in that directory. Once you do that, you have to also set the environment variables. Okay. And once you set the environment variables, which is nothing but new home, as you can see here. So what you have to do is you have to open your command prompt and you have to run the a few batch files. Okay. So which is that batch, batch file? So as you can see here, you have to, this is mule home, which is the environment variable. And here in this bin folder, there is this file called mule.bat, which is a batch file. Okay. Once you execute this command on the command prompt, Okay, if that command runs successfully, the next step would be using this command. Okay, as you can see here, mule home bin mule mule.bat and then install. So what you do by running this command, you install the mule soft using the command prompt. Okay, so basically these are the commands from Windows environment. Okay, so if you're using Linux or Mac OS, so the commands for that are different. Okay, so once you run this command, as you can see here, install. So basically, this is the process of starting the mule services. Okay. So there are two ways to start the mule services. Either you can start as Windows services or you can start it as Linux daemons as well. Okay. So if you're using Linux operating system, so the command to start mule services for that operating systems are different. Okay. So on Windows, you'll be running these commands. The first one is install. And after that, the next command would be start. Okay. So once is this step is done, mule start, mule dot bat, and then start. Okay. So you will now be able to run mule applications from your command line terminal, or you can call it command terminal. Okay. So this was a very simple process to download and install mule soft on your system. So once you run this command start, so what you'll be doing is you'll be running your mule soft applications after this command. Okay. So this was a very simple process. So as you can see on the screen, I, here I've attached a screenshot. Okay. So since I'm using Windows operating system, these are the commands. Okay. First setting the environment variable, which is the mule home. Then this is the command called start. Okay. And once you run this command here, it will show you the message starting mule enterprise edition. Okay. And once you see the running here, like the running and the process ID. So this means that everything is going smooth on your system and you're ready to run the mule applications. Okay. Yeah. So the next question here is what are the prerequisites to run the mule code? So the answer to this question is very simple. Okay. So there are a few things that you must understand about your system and the application configuration in order to run a mule code. Okay. So the first step here is Java installation. First, you need to verify that your system has Java installed on it. You can download any latest version of Java to support the mule configuration. So after Java installation, the next step would be the operating system. So there are various operating systems that are supported by mule, such as Windows, Windows Server, Mac OS, Ubuntu Server, Linux kernel, Solaris, HP, and so on. Okay. Once you're ready with the mule, let's understand the database that is required for running the mule application. Okay. So mule runs its standalone server so that you do not require any additional database application support for this. Okay. So, but if you're required to process data or access data store in mule, you're required to configure a particular server for it. Okay. So for that purpose, you need to have any one of the following databases such as Oracle, MySQL, IBM DB2, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL server, and so on. Okay. So now the last point here is the system configuration. So if you talk about the system configuration requirement for Mule, so you must have minimum two gigahertz of CPU or one virtual CPU in virtualized environments. You must have at least one GB of RAM and at least four GB of storage space. Okay. 
So these are the system configurations that are required to run the Mule applications or the Mule code. So let's move on to the next question. The next question here is, how can you deploy Mule apps or the Mule applications? So the first step here is set up and start Mule. So once Mule is started, as we have seen earlier, you can deploy the Mule app by move, moving the jar package files to the apps directory in the Mule home. Okay, so this was the first step. After this, the second step is stopping the Mule services. So there are two ways using which you can stop or remove the running Mule from your terminal. Okay, so if you're using the Windows environment, so what you can do is you can use the command Mule space remove. Okay, and the other way of doing it is using the command Mule space stop. So once you use this command Mule stop, this will stop your application. Okay, so this was a very simple process to deploy the Mule applications. So in a nutshell, the process is very simple. Set up Mule, start Mule, deploy your application, do whatever you want, and then stop the Mule services. And how to stop the Mule services? You can use either Mule remove command or Mule stop command. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question here is how to use Mule HQ with Mule. Okay, so this is a very important question as far as your interview is concerned. If you are able to answer this question, guys, I guarantee you that your interview is successful. So how to use Mule HQ with Mule? So you just have to add the following snippet of code as you can see on the screen. And there are various components to this code such as the agent name, class name. Okay, so this was the first agent and this is the second agent. The first agent is RMI and the second agent is JMX and it also has a class name. Okay, then you have the property name, which is connector server URI. After that, you have map name and property name. Okay, so once you add this code to your Mule configuration, you have to restart your Mule instance. Okay, and after that, you have to ensure that the HQ agent is running on the server, the Mule instance is configured on and is pointing to the desired HQ server. Okay, you also have to check the Mule HQ server page to see if information about the Mule instance is being received. Okay, so once these points are clear, you will have no problem with your application. So let's move on to the next question. So the next question is, like if you're running a Mule application or deploying a Mule application, okay, you might get this error. So the what is the error? Unable to get the source, source from the repository. And this error is being generated while building the Mule applications or the Mule examples. Okay, so how do you tackle this error? So guys, for your reference, I have attached this screenshot here. Okay, and this is the second part of the screenshot. Okay, so here what you can see is build error and failed to resolve artifact. So how do you resolve this error? Okay, so to resolve this error, you just have to change the version of the dependency in the pom.xml file. Okay, so for the running the Mule application, you'll have a pom.xml file. So in that file, you have to just change the version value of the dependency. So this is a very simple change that you need to do in the pom.xml file. And once you do that, this error will be resolved. Okay, so to solve this error, you must understand the components of the pom.xml file. So let's move on to the last question of this session. Okay, so the last question here is, what to do if you get this error, Mule is not able to start and check your environment. Okay, so what is the meaning of this error? So to ensure that you don't get this error, you have to follow a few steps as you can see on the screen. So what are those steps? So first you must ensure that your Mule home or the Mule home environment variable is set up correctly. Okay, so Mule home should be the location of the Mule install. Okay, as we have seen earlier in the previous question, how do you set the Mule environment? variables okay so similar to mule environment variables then you have the java home which is the java environment variables okay so the location should be same and that same location should be set in the environment variables okay and the third variable here is the path okay so this path in the list of environment variables should have both the java home slash bin and the mule home slash bin in the path variable so once you ensure these three things you won't be able to get this error. Mule is not able to start and check your environment variables. Okay, so this was all about the MuleSoft interview questions. Okay, with this, we have come to the end of this session on MuleSoft interview questions. So guys, we have tried to cover maximum questions here. Okay, in case if you feel or if you have any doubt regarding these questions, you can write them in the comments box and my team is here to help you with all your doubts and queries. Okay, for those guys who are appearing for a MuleSoft interview, I wish you all the best. Okay, 
And once you revise this question, like if you watch this video till the end, and if you revise these questions, I guarantee you that you will successfully clear the interview. So that was all from my side. Till then, all the best and happy learning.